So please welcome to talk about and show all the really groovy, cool stuff in the new Avid Media Composer, Woo! it's reimagined Michael Krulik. Hey. <laughs> I like that introduction, that's awesome. Uh, thank you all. Um, by the way, we, we do know that there are people who are using you know, different versions of Media Composer. I've even talked to people who are using version five. So uh, they, if they say if it ain't broke, you know, they're, they're fine. So. Uh, we know that there are many people, a lot of people out there using uh, different versions of Media Composer. Just to see a show of hands, is there anybody out there who has never used Media Composer? And don't be shy. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, welcome. Um, hopefully you'll see some really uh, interesting stuff here. Um, and I'll zoom in as much as possible. Hopefully you can see the menu. Uh, I just found out that one of the bulbs burned. So I will zoom in as much as possible to highlight that, anything that I'm going through. But again, we do know that there are many people out there who are using different versions of Avid Media Composer. Um, we also know that there are people who have never seen it. There are people who have been away from it for a while. So um, Media Composer was introduced in 1989. So actually the Avid one, so the first Avid. So it's 30 years old, 30 years of development and users. So for all of you that have been using it, we do like to thank you all for your support. And there were editors actually involved in the process of helping make this new version of Avid, which was released on June 20th of this year. Um, it is 2019.6, 2019.7 was just released. Uh, so we have some fixes from uh, 2019.6. But the interesting thing is the release has been extremely positive. Um, it, it's a nice change. We know that we do have a lot of editors that you know don't like change. When I first saw it, I was a little frightened for myself, uh, mainly because I was going to be showing it to everybody. Um, but uh, it, it's actually grown on me, and it, there's some really great things there that I'm finding, and again, a lot of positive feedback. Um, but we also know, again, with a lot of people who've never seen Media Composer before, we want it to be a little more inviting. We wanted it to be a little refreshed and also a little uh, more intuitive as to how it works. So you'll see that as I go through the uh, interface. Uh, just to, I'll zoom in and just give you a little look on the different uh, views or what we're looking at. We have changed the way that your panels are actually, uh, your windows are titled with this little uh, reimagined vertical title, something that the engineers thought, hey, we'll do something a little different. It's now highlighted so you can actually see it when you select it. Um, so you do have your, your bins, you have your source and record window, you have your timeline. Everything is the same. Uh, you can map, you can still map your keys, you can map your menus, but um, there, I mean, there are a couple of things that have changed that I will point out. One thing you'll see on the far right side is these options here, these workspaces for edit, color, effects, and audio are you know, just like other NLEs. You know, if you look at some of them, there's a different button that you push to change the menu to change your workspace. Uh, traditionally, everyone in Media Composer knows, oh, well, I go to Windows, I go to Workspaces, and I can change them here, or I can map them to my key. But the nice thing about the workspaces on the right side is you click, and it changes for your different workspaces. So again, more intuitive to somebody who's never seen this. How do I go into color? Oh, look, I go into color, now I'm in color correction. Now I go into effects, now I'm in audio, and these are the defaults. If I go in and change a workspace, if I, I change a look, if I simply select the little widget right here, right click, actually click on it, I can say new workspace, I can give this a new name, we'll call it LA CPUG 1. When I say OK, that now comes up as a new workspace right down here that I can select, and all the new workspaces come down there. So a nice new way to look at your workspaces, but that little area there takes up real estate. There are editors, editors out there that say, I don't need that. I have that mapped to a key. Why do I have to have that in my layout? Well, if you right click, you can go down to an icon only, or you can simply hide it from your layout. So you don't even see it at all. It's still mapped to your keys, or you do have a little pull down up here where you can select 
your workspace is in the far upper right corner. And you can show your workspace bar by simply bringing it back up right here. So little workspaces, nice and easy. You decide how you want to visualize the layouts that you create. Now looking at the UI, again talking to a lot of editors out there, uh, when you're opening up bins and tools, your bins, your tools, everything's on top of one another. You have to move things out of the way. There are editors out there that said, we don't like that. Please do something. There are other NLEs that don't do that. Well, we now have a paneled UI. So you have all of your windows can be locked, so you don't have any layers on top of one another. But if you like that, you can still float your panels. So if I want to float this bin, I simply pull it out. That's now floating on top of your layout. If you want to drop that back into your panel, we'll simply take it, I'll hold down a modifier into my bin area here, and that now is tabbing it into my bin area. Again, we're trying to give you a clean look. If I take this entire, do you remember super bins? Avid designed super bins because at that time, people were just moving into putting their editing software on a laptop. And having a single window, when you started having bins opened on top of one another, and it just created a whole chaotic layout. So the super bin basically tabbed everything you selected into a certain region. So this bin container in the upper uh, left-hand corner is now my new super bin, the bin container which contains my bins. If I pull that out, that can float. And what you'll see is the source and record window, my composer window, fills my entire canvas behind it, as does my timeline. So that is my edit monitor. If I have two monitors set up, I have an edit monitor, I have a bin monitor, and I have my different views as I want to see them. And if I take my bin container and pull that back in, you see what happens when I move a tool or a panel, the green bars that pop up around your layout, those are your drop zones. So if I want to drop my bin container back to the left side of my composer window, my source record window, I let go and it puts it back into my paneled display. So again, you set up the way you want to work. Now looking at the layouts here as well, again talking about the bin container, uh, well actually I know what I want to talk about. Uh, something that has changed is there's no more project window. No more project window. <laughs> Don't be afraid. What uh, editors told us is the project window looked like a bin. So sometimes you'd be closing bins, you'd close your project. Not that it was the end of the world, but it was you know disrupting your editing. So what we've done, I was talking about this bin container in the upper left or wherever you have it. If I open up the left side, I have my list of bins. That's my project window. Those are the bins that I know and I love. I can close them, I can open them, all depending on how I want to show my bin container. I also want to point out that the icon for a bin has changed. It now is an open bin or a closed bin. So it actually is a little more interesting than just a, a highlight and a darken, depending on if it's open or closed. Also, um, you know, the old bin was two strips of film hanging above a bin. Two strips of what? Exactly. Two strips of what? <laughs> hanging above a So it, what happens is all these young, new editors coming in probably have never touched film, so they don't understand what two strips of film hanging above a bin is. I'm sure they do because they learned that, but as far as the icon, we changed it and refreshed it to look a little more like a bin so you can see what is opened and closed. Um, so that was a little design element there. But back to the bin container, the bin container contains your bins. If I double click on a bin, it opens up as a tab in my bin container. Now there is an option if I go to, I think it's my interface, uh, and I can say if I double click on a bin, float the bin. So if that's what you would rather do, rather than having it tab into your layout, you could double click on a bin and it will float that bin, and then you can decide if you want to tab it or not. You can keep that floating. So um, 
no project window isn't the end of the world. It's just a little different because basically, once you get into your project, all you need is your list of bins that you're looking at. Now with the bin container, if I go in and create a new bin container, it defaults to be floating. But the inter interesting thing is you'll see that your bin sidebar with your list of bins is on every bin container. Uh, the interesting thing is when I was first shown that, I was like, well, that's silly. Why would I need that if I'm floating my bins? But one of the engineers said, somebody mentioned that you know they don't have to keep reaching over to the second monitor if they want to go and open up a bin. So now all I have to do is double click and it opens in the bin over here. Now I can close that if I want, so that's a standard floating bin, or I can open it so I have access to any bin over on this side here. And any vertical tool, any tab, any panel uh, can be floating, it can be paneled, or I can also dock it as a tabbed <coughs> tool. So here I have one bin container. Let's say I have another bin container that I want for all of my music and sound effects. I can take that bin container and I can drop it, not in the layout as a panel, but holding down a modifier, it now is a tabbed tool or bin container. So you can actually build different tabs of different elements inside of there in your completed workspace. So you're just, again, deciding how you want to show stuff. All right, so no project window. Don't be afraid. Uh, but what that also means is you don't have, uh, where's your settings? How do you go in and change your settings? How do you map your keys? How do you uh, modify anything? Well, what we've done is we've put that under the file pull down, which means I can use a key to access my settings. So I could map settings to a key. I mapped it to Shift, a, uh, Shift S, and it brings up my settings. So that's my format tab. I can change my format. Versions ago, we changed so you can actually do 16K projects. <laughs> Scary. Um, we actually put that in there to. to <laughs> exactly. We put that in there to future proof, uh, but also for digital signage. So you can actually work 16K. Um, but also you'll see here that we've built in new color spaces like ACES. So we've built in a fully ACES capable workflow in the new version, um, which is great. But you also see the project user and site settings are under your settings tab and they are in their own tabs. So you're not having to search through an entire list of settings now. They've actually uh, defined them into certain areas, uh, different tabs. You have your user profiles. If I go to, let me see if it's bin. Double clicking a closed bin tabs the bin into the active panel in a bin container or floats the bin. You can check it here, all right? Also, controller command and double click inverts the act, uh, active setting. So you can actually say, wait, I'd rather float it. If you haven't gone into your settings, just hold down command or control, double click and it'll do the opposite. Okay, so that's just a setting. All right, uh, no settings. Uh, how do you find out what your system ID is or what plugins you have? That is under about Avid Media Composer. So selecting that brings up your version. It also brings up your configuration, usage, and hardware. So your other options are under there if you need to access them. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and discuss a little bit more about the bin container. Again, the bin container contains your bins. Um, I can pull that out and float it. So here I have my bin monitor. Let me go ahead and just double click on a couple more bins. They're going to tab. So uh, they, we could keep them tabbed if we'd like. But the nice thing about this new UI is I can take by grabbing the tab, you get your little green drop zones inside of the bin container. So I can say, I want to split this view so I have two bins open in one bin container. Or I could take another one, and I'm going to put it in between both of those. So I now have another view built into my layout. And that can be vertical, that can be horizontal. You're designing how you want to display your 
your bins. If you have a script, if you're doing script sync or scripting or anything like that, that can be a panel inside of there. You can have a bin container of your scripts. You know, you're deciding how you want to create this. So again, your bins can float, they can be paneled, you're setting it up as you want to see it. So again, it's, it's actually really a nice design depending on how you want to set that up. And you can have bins side by side. You can have bin containers side by side. Again, you're deciding how you want to have that. So I'm going to take this and put this back into my display. We'll drop it back into our panel. You'll see it maintains its layout that I have. It's just in a smaller window. Go ahead and just close some of these. We'll take clips, put that back in a tab there. And in our view, you still have uh, text and script and frame mode for viewing. We actually moved the options to the top because editors said, you know, rather than having it down on the bottom, their eyes naturally went to the top to look for things. So that's nice. When you're in frame mode, you now have a slider to change your view, your size. It's still Control-L or Command-L and Command-K for small. So you have Command-K, Control-K for small, Command-L, uh, Command, or Control-L for large. But again, being more intuitive for somebody who's just learning this, they know by looking at photos or docs or Excel spreadsheets that a slider is the way to make something uh, large or small to zoom in. And the nice thing that the, the uh, engineers did in designing this is when you make your bin smaller, watch what happens as your buttons collapse into a single pull down to select. Whereas before, you'd have to go, oh, I need to go to my script mode, my text, okay, there. Now I can make that smaller. So again, just another interesting design choice. Now another thing, uh, a very unique thing, unique to Avid, we you know, decided we wanted to make something a little different here. As you're looking through, oh, some media offline, um, some link media, if we go through and take a look at, you, you'll see that your bin actually is larger than what is being viewed. So when in frame mode with Media Composer 2019.7 now, starting at .6, if you right click, you have an option to select show bin map. And what this is, is a landscape view of your bin. In the corner of your uh, bin that you're viewing. And the white outline is what you're actually seeing here. So, oh wait a minute, I have a clip down here. You click and it takes you there. You actually can move around this just like a map, a little video game. Ooh, a little landscape, you know, moving around that. Just as a nice view because as people are building storyboards or their bins, they're moving stuff into different areas to look at. The nice thing is you now have an overall look that you can uh, preview right here. And again, you just right click, hide bin map, and it's gone. All right? Really interesting, really nice. All right, uh, the weightlifter. Dun, da, da, is back. Uh, some people will say they didn't know he was gone or she was gone. I guess it's the weightlifter, not the lift man. Uh, so the scissors and the weightlifter are back. Uh, the keys were always the same, but at one point, uh, a designer said that people who were using Final Cut at the time, the reason why we changed this, didn't know what a weightlifter did. Okay? <laughs> well, Let's just say that, right, the, uh, the icon is back. Um, the interesting thing is I was at a, a doing a demonstration uh, at a reseller, and there was a young lady there who had never seen Media Composer before, and she actually raised her hand and said, what's up with that lift person? What's up with the weightlifter? And I had to explain, but again, this is, again, something, somebody doesn't understand what that is, but we all know that the weightlifter lifts your clips if you select it. Um, so the icons, this was an original icon. If you remember, Lightworks had the shark, right, to, the shark. <laughs> to delete something. This is the equivalent. This is our iconic icon, and he's, he, she is back. Um, so uh, also another thing I want to point out is you might notice in the timeline the smart tool. The smart tool is gone. Well, it's gone from the timeline. The smart tool, uh, if you have seen it before, uh, it was a set of tools that were on the left of the timeline, which put you into your selection modes, your trim modes, your transition manipulation, just made a live timeline 
for selecting and doing uh, some changes. Traditionally, when a Media Composer editor clicked in the timeline, nothing moves, which is kind of important because you didn't want to move something out of sync, you didn't want to trim something you didn't want to. You always had to go into a mode, and that's what the Smart Tool did. It made a, a live timeline for selection, which Pro Tools has had for years, but also Final Cut and these other uh, NLEs had it all the time. So basically, the Smart Tool has been moved from the left side of the timeline, and it now has buttons that can be mapped to keys. It could be mapped before, but they're also placed up above the timeline. If you right click, you can turn on or off what smart tool you want to have active. Or you can hold down a modifier if you hold down option and just click, it cycles you through your selection. And again, if you have the need or want to map to the keyboard, you have your command palette, which has smart tools that you can add there as well to a key or to your um, timeline or buttons on your menu. Now I do want to point out something real important. This has been a, a kind of a sticky point with uh, people who are downloading the new software. The digital scrub has been removed from the cap locks. Ooh. <laughs> but it is mappable if you go to play, toggle digital audio scrub, but you can't map it to cap locks. It's still hard to toggle. But you can toggle it. It's still a toggle, and you can map it to a key. Now the nice thing about that, and if you don't know what that did, basically I've mapped it to a shift A, is if you are playing something, I need to get some audio here, let me go to source browser, let me bring in some editors speaking. All right, here's Kate. And uh, while she's talking, sure. if you hold down shift, you get the audio scrub, the digital scrub. People would put cap locks on, and that would keep that on so you wouldn't have to hold down shift. You know, I personally didn't like that because if I went to a computer, that meant every time I typed, I was yelling because somebody had left cap locks on. Um, so I always turn that off. But if you do map it to a key, so I did put it on shift A, now it does the same thing. It's just not on cap lock. That's a little uh, sort of heads up uh, if you download uh, Media Composer 2019. So that's the digital audio scrub. I hit Shift A and it's off. So it is still mappable. You just can't put it on the key that everybody has been using for uh, a while. A little side, side note here that I do want to point out as well, not something that was in 2019, but something that was been in, put in the software for, I think, a year or so is Composer if you're playing and you speed up, you get the mini Mouse. You get, you know, you're trying to find some other audio on that to maybe stop. You want to actually uh, pan through it a lot faster, speed through it. Um, a few versions ago, or a year or so ago, what we did was in the, I hit Shift S for my settings. If I go to my audio settings, there is an option to pitch correction during shuttle, turn it on. By default, it's off. So now, if I go back to play Kate, and I actually did have L. an avid there, um, but I use it. But I know I do really it. You don't get Minnie Mouse, so you don't get the little high pitch on that. So that's a little tip and trick. If you go to your audio settings in your version, you might be able to be that changing that be now. Default. Sorry. That should be the default. It should be the default. Um, <laughs> good, good, good feature request. <laughs> Uh, okay, back to 2019, and then um, if we have time, I'll do some other tips and tricks. Um, smart tool, uh, oh yeah. If you're trying to look for metadata, and you usually will go into your text mode, and you'll go and you'll say, okay, I need to go and show my columns, and let's see, I wanna go in and select what columns do I want to have uh, exposed that I will then have to scroll back and forth to see what that metadata is. You know, it, it's 
it's okay. Maybe you have a, a layout for your bin that you like to see, but I like to work in frame mode because I like the visual. If I go to the inspector tool, which is a new option in 2019, it brings up a window, whoops, which if I select an item, it shows me metadata for whatever I'm selecting. That can be the source window, that could be the record window, and it changes, and it's dockable. So I can take this and put it into my layout. So now whatever I'm selecting, I can see metadata, I can change things like maybe the color of a clip, I can change name. If I'm on a sequence, I get information like, I could change the name of the sequence, how many tracks, the duration, the format, frame rate. I could even go in and change the starting time code here. So I don't have to go to the find or the, the get info or sequence report, whichever way people go in and change all of that. Could you change which plugin is being used to access the media? Um, uh, interesting. I haven't tried that. Uh, the question was, can you change the plugin at this point to what uh, what plugin is using to access the media? So it shows the plugin here, but it's not letting me change. But that that's interesting. That'd be a good. I will remember that, Michael Thomas. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean that that's something that can be dropped in. Again, if you want to tab other things, like maybe you have the uh, have your markers. So if I look at markers, I can take my markers, I'll pull them over here, but if I hold down a modifier, I've now tabbed it, so I now have the inspector tool and the markers in one little window. That can be saved as a workspace that you bring up, okay? Now, uh, it's not all about just the UI. Uh, there, again, are some nice things here that we did add, uh, but we also wanted to add features Beyond the features that we added at the end of the year with shape-based color correction um, and background bin save and things like that, uh, and the multicam tools, but what we've brought in here is more finishing and delivery. So one thing we've added, if you take a look at your different quality settings down here, the video quality, we now go up to full quality float. This is 32-bit. So you'll see that the icon turns to a full blue. We're now in full 32-bit float for the highest quality uh, video that you can get out of Media Composer at this point. A lot of this is for deliverables, for finishing, for Netflix, and for other uh, groups as well. So 32-bit float. We also can create media that is, let's say I want to go in and transcode a clip. Um, I am. Oh, I'm at, uh, I'm at a 1080, so I'm at DNX HD. Of course, DNX HD only goes up to HD. So if I change my project frame rate or format to be, let's say, 2K, now if I go in to do a transcode, you'll see it's DNX HR. So those are high res, but we now have also incorporated DNX uncompressed up to 32-bit float. Now you do have to have storage that can support something at that high resolution, but the idea is you can work with this if you need to. You can turn on proxy mode if you've uh, ever seen that. If you are working with any of the high resolutions and your computer can't support playing that back, turn it on to a quarter or sixteenth proxy and you may be able to get a better performance playback on that. But the nice thing here is you can actually work 32-bit float with the media and transcode to a DNX. It's interesting because DNX was supposed to be a really high compression that looked great, but low bandwidth. Uh, but now DNX uncompressed takes it to the next level where it's not totally uncompressed. It's using DNX as a compression on it, but at a high resolution. And also, we have incorporated being able to render and work or mix down OP1A. So normally, Media Composer works OP Atom, where if you have video, a video and audio file, when you transcode or work with it in Avid Media, it splits the audio and video into separate MXF files. Uh, OP1A muxes it into a single file for playback. 
and we can render, we can uh, support, we can link natively to MXF OP1A media and even do mix downs. You'll see if we go to your media creation settings, you can turn your media type to actually work totally OP1A. It actually puts it into a different Avid media file folder in the folder structure on your system. So it doesn't go into MXF, it goes into an EMU uh, folder. So it is a separate folder. A little warning, if you create MXF OP1A media here, that will not work in earlier versions of Media Composer, so you won't be able to take that. So make sure if you do set this up that you go back to OP Atom if you do need to create media for to go back to another system. Um, and also along those lines for delivery, if I go to export, <coughs> I can now export an IMF package directly out of Media Composer. So I'm working 32-bit. I have DNX uncompressed media or high-res media, and you'll see that I can create a J2K package for deliverable to Netflix or anybody else who needs it. It'll actually just create a folder with your media, your XML data, anything that you need that you'll be able to hand off for uh, delivery inside of the system. Uh, one thing I do want to show, uh, oh, there's some lights, uh, some features. Again, it's not just in 2019, but there's some really cool stuff that a lot of people didn't know, and I show it, and they're like, oh my god, you just saved me so much time, is selection tools in the timeline. If you haven't seen this, one thing you can, you have your select left and select right for your active tracks. But if you hold down option when you are selecting left and selecting right, it doesn't choose filler. So that means it's not going to wipe out any of those extra things when you're moving any clips around. Oh, somebody turned on my wireframe. Uh, I think it might flip that. I haven't tried that. Let me go to my timeline settings because for some reason, yep, someone turned on my wireframe dragging. That means uh, with it off, which is the default, if I go in and do a selection move, I don't get the wireframe outline. I actually get a better indication of the clips that I'm moving. The nice thing about that that I want to point out is if you turn on waveforms and you decide I need to move this clip over, it ghosts the waveform so you now have an indication of where the audio is landing. So if you're looking to see where noise is coming in, where a sound bite is coming in, you actually have a better idea of where it's landing so you're not just, oh no, two frames, you can actually see by the ghost on, you can see that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm getting a different angle here. Um, so, uh, so that's nice. But the selection tools, besides your select left and select right, if you right click in the timeline, you get selection tools here. So if you color code your clips, and I know a lot of people do because they color code if you're doing VFX, if you're doing sound, you know, different things might be colored. Everyone color does things differently. If I select this blue color here and maybe this green down here, did a shift select on both these colors, then I right click and say select everything with the same source clip color. Everything with the same source clip color has this little gray color now. But if I right click, I can say create a sequence based on that selection. <laughs> this is probably in the version of software you have now. So take a look. If you right click and see the selection tools, they're there. So now if I select the rough bin and put it in there, when I double click, it's only those clips. So rather than duplicating a sequence and deleting the shots that you don't want to create a template, select what you do want and create a sequence that way. Or there also are selections to select left, right, same source clip color, no source clip color, offline clips, which is nice. You have an hour long sequence and you don't know what's offline rather than expanding it out and trying to find everything red. Select offline clips, create a sequence, you have an instant sequence of all the media that maybe you need to go find. And clips with the same uh, local clip color or reverse. So select what you don't want and then reverse your selection and then create a sequence of that. So really nice tools inside of here. If you didn't know, the up and down arrow keys 
now move clips up and down in the timeline. This has been in there for about a year, I think. Uh, nice thing about that as well is if you have clips that even aren't um, on the same tracks, do a shift select, they'll move. They, depending on what you're doing, you do want to be careful because if you have a clip on top and if you are in segment mode and you're overwriting, whoa, it went away. So you do want to be careful of that. But the nice thing about that also is if you hold down option, it duplicates. So you can duplicate clips, try something else. You're trying to do a little, you know, split, a little effect, a little cutaway, easy to do. That means you don't have to go, oh, wait, I need to line that up. What do I, you know, how do I, how do I do that rather than doing it manually? Just select it and move it up and down. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, if you haven't seen, I'm sorry if you've seen this. It's another one of my things I love to show because people didn't know we could do it so easily is, uh, if I have some music, so it's going to probably be some really interesting music. Let's hear it. Okay, a little jazzy, great. So uh, if I want to take that, we're just going to move it down a couple tracks. Again, use the arrow keys. Uh, if I take a clip where somebody's speaking. Down, there's a. And we'll just drop him. Doc right here, and let's maybe take, you know, little Kate. We'll put her here as it's playing. A huge goal. Of course, we can't hear. We can't hear Doc. So normally, everyone goes in and they add keyframes and drop them down. Well, several, I'd say at least a couple years ago, it's even in the free version of Media Composer, Media Composer First, we put in audio ducking. It's in the timeline, audio ducking, and it's right click, audio ducking. So all you're doing is you're saying, you're selecting my dialogue and my music tracks, automatically duck the audio and it automatically dropped and added the keyframes. So now, a huge goal is to be really fast. You know, it's like you want your. You can still go in and tweak it if you need to. Whoops. You can still grab your keyframes and move them. Also, if you didn't know, if you add a marker around keyframes, so if you do an in and out for a region, it'll actually take everything in between so you don't have to try and match up each on there. But if I go in back into audio ducking, on the bottom here, by default, that's closed. You open that up, you have control on how long the ramp time is or what your attenuation is on that. And if you already have ducked your entire sequence and you only want to do a region, mark an in and out and only change what you've marked by just selecting that. So that's built into the software. Um, great, we have about five minutes. Any other questions, or I can show you some other stuff? Yes? Any new features with the, um, the fast menu, or is that pretty much still the same? The uh, fast menu, or hamburger? Is hamburger that menu. The hamburger, well, the hamburger has changed. They say it now looks like a hot dog because they took <laughs> off the sides. Um, so. Oh, Right, exactly. So uh, no, nothing has changed inside of that, although I do want to point out that the hamburger in the center has gone away. Don't be afraid. I mean, that you still have the tools that you can map there. Basically, the hamburger, that fast menu in the middle, was just a set of buttons. It was just sort of like a, a drop zone for extra buttons that you know you could add on there. So I think uh, there is a plan to maybe add that at some point as a tool or a panel of extra buttons that can be added. But all of the buttons that were there can be still mapped to a key, like your blue arrow, your replace, um, is still available. All right. Um, another thing real quick I want to show is if you are uh, creating uh, something with you know, multiple tracks, I'm just throwing, throwing a bunch of stuff here. If you go in and 
decide this is something that's been in the software for a while. If you look at your different layers, again, we have two shots of Kate, and we have this uh, background here. Match frame, you don't have to have your tracks active. Everyone normally knows I have to have it active. I hit match frame, and it matches. If you right-click on the track name, match frame track has been in the software for years. And what that means is I can be anywhere on my sequence. I want to match frame to what is on V1. So I point to V1, right-click, match frame track. V2, match frame track. V3, match frame track. And I don't have to turn on, turn off everything else and turn on only the track I want to do a match frame on. Little tip, if you're on a Mac, if you hold down command and double click on the track name, it does the same thing. So just a fast way to match frame on that. And another uh, trick that I'll add in here real quick that I show, again, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but these are all really great nuggets, is if you go in and you want to insert a new track, everyone knows that you can right click, new track, video track, audio track, or command Y, but that always adds it to the top. But if you put an option or alt with that, command option Y, you get add track. And if I say I want to add a new video track, and by the way, if you didn't know, we now have 64 tracks of video. We did that at the end of the year, we added that. The engineers didn't tell everyone. I went in, and I was like, 64? People are like, don't tell the producers. Um, <laughs> Can they all be 16K? <laughs> yes, if you want. <laughs> I dare you. I challenge you. Um, so I want to I want to add a new V1. So if I say, all right, new V1, it says it already exists. What do you want to do? If I say insert, it pushes everything up and gives me a clean V1 to work with. So usually people go, oh, we'll select everything and drag it up because I want a new track. You don't have to do that. Just to add an option, a little uh, funny story. I was in New York doing a presentation, and a uh, teacher at um, NYU said she always tells her students that if you ever think, wow, I wish there was an option to do that, sometimes if you hold down the option key, it might do it, you know? So give, give, give it a try. Uh, yep, it pushed it all up. So can you still label tracks? Oh, yeah. Right click, rename the track, and it'll actually add um, we'll put VFX. Okay, so it just, well, so would it made it V6 then? V6 VFX? Well, let's see. If I go in and add a new V2, okay, insert. on up. Great. So um, yeah, this is the new reimagined media composer moving forward. Again, some nice changes there. Um, we've incorporated all again the new stuff with the multicam editing, adding cameras to existing multicam groups, um, shape-based color correction, uh, and the new title tool that goes higher than HD, which has been getting better as well. Um, but uh, it's, it's all been through input from, you know, all of you, and we definitely appreciate your time and your work and effort for helping to make, you know, Media Composer what it is today. And we have to move along. Please, thanks. Thank you very much. Michael Krillick.